Father, we thank you for the time that we have together. We ask that as we continue to study, that you'll continue to lead us. We want to be led by your spirit. We want to be guided by you so that we know the way, the path in which you would have us to travel. We want to be ready for Jesus to come, and we want to help others to be ready for Jesus to come. And we just thank you for what you're going to do in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, we're talking about the fall of Babylon, but let's go to the quiz first, because this is going to be a hard one. A hard quiz. The only chapter in the book of Daniel not written by Daniel is chapter 4. It was written by Nebuchadnezzar. Only chapter not written by Daniel, chapter 4, written by Nebuchadnezzar. Um, two points off when you ask, answer out loud. Man, I can let you get away with that. <laughs> Number two. God allowed Nebuchadnezzar to go insane because he wanted to make fun of him. God allowed Nebuchadnezzar to go insane because he wanted to make fun of him. <clears throat> Number three. As a result of his insanity, Nebuchadnezzar was humbled. And when he recovered, he acknowledged the God of heaven as the true God. Nebuchadnezzar, after his insanity, acknowledged God as the true God. Number four, God saves people by grace plus works that they are able to do. God saves people by grace plus works that they are able to do. And then the word believe means to have implicit trust in Jesus Christ and to put our full weight on him. Now you know what it means to put your full weight? You put your whole trust in him. All right, let's see who got their answers right. I think you should do pretty good this time. The only chapter in the book of Daniel not written by Daniel is chapter 4. And who was it written by? Is that true? That's absolutely true. Number two, God allowed Nebuchadnezzar to go insane because he wanted to make fun of him. False, that's right. God loved that king so much. And even Daniel loved the king. And he wanted to help the king. And he tried to help the king. God tried to help the king. God tried to show the king, if you follow this, you'll be fine. But if you don't, and that's where we saw some conditional prophecy. God predicted. But it could have gone the other way if Nebuchadnezzar would have listened. Okay? Number three. As a result of his insanity, Nebuchadnezzar was humbled. And when he recovered, he acknowledged the God of heaven as the true God. True, true that's right. And then number four, it says, God saves people by grace plus works in which they are able to do. How many of you think it's false? How many of you think it's true? How many of you don't know? It's false. Remember? Ephesians 2, 8 and 9, it says we're saved by grace through faith. And it also goes on to say that we are created by God to do what? Good works. So righteousness by faith, but works come with? Let me ask you this. Why does an orange tree bear oranges? Because it's an orange tree. Why does a Christian have good works? Because they're Christians. In other words, what we're trying to say here is that you're not saved by your works. Your works show that you've been saved. Because if you love God, you're going to follow God. 
if you say you love God, but you do everything contrary to what biblical principles even t say, well, the Bible says you're a liar. Don't expect anything from it, but a hot place on earth. Okay? And number five, the word believe. It means to have implicit trust in Jesus Christ and to put your full weight upon him. True, absolutely. Put everything upon God. You trust him with everything you have because he's the only one that you can get truth from on a consistent basis. He never changes. He says he's the same yesterday, today, and forever. All right? Okay. So, let's take our Bibles, and I want us to go and open the Bible for a few minutes here to a few of these Bible verses, and let's see what they say. We're going to John 13, 34. And 35. And the Bible says, I'm reading from the New King James, it says, A new commandment I give to you, that you love who? One another, One another as I have loved you, that you also love one another. By this all will know that you are what? My disciples. So how do people know that you're a disciple of God? You love people. And you care for them. You reach out to them. You're willing to take care of people's needs. You, you just, you have a passion for people. Did Jesus have a passion for people? Did, I mean, he, he, mean, he, he came here to die that we could all have eternal life. But he was always looking for people and looking to help them the way that they needed it, right? Um, is that our example? Absolutely. Let's go to Leviticus 19.18. I know you're already there because I heard your pages turn. And it says, You shall not take vengeance, nor bear any grudge against the children of your people, but you shall what? Love your neighbor as yourself. Have you heard that before? Who said that? Jesus said that. So where did he get it from? He didn't get it from the New Testament because there wasn't a New Testament. He got it from the Old Testament. That's all that was available to him. He says, I am the Lord. Love your neighbor. Okay, John 17, 17. John 17, 17, and the Bible says, Sanctify them by your truth. truth. Your word is truth. truth. The word sanctify means to be set apart for God. So how are you going to set a person apart for God? And they have to look to truth, don't they? So you have to look to what's true, what's holy. And then... And where are you going to get that truth from? The Bible. Hosea 4, 6. Hosea 4 and verse 6. And the Bible says, My people are destroyed for what? Because you have what? Rejected knowledge. I also will reject you from being priest for me. The Bible says we're all kings and priests when we give our lives to Jesus, right? So what's the Bible saying here to us? What's it saying? It says, my people destroyed. They die for a lack of knowledge. They need knowledge. Where do you get knowledge from? From the Bible, from God's Word. And it says, I will reject you from being a priest for me. Why? 
because you've rejected him. How do we reject God? How do we reject God? But not by not following his word, by not obeying him, by, by not accepting the knowledge and the wisdom that he's wanting to give to us, we actually are rejecting God, aren't we? Okay, so that's a powerful statement, isn't it? John 17 and verse 21. And the Bible says they, um, that they all may be one as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they also may be one with us, that the world may believe that you sent me. What does Christ want for us? To be with him, to be one with him, to be one with him. And it takes you back to, you know, the verse in Genesis, the two shall become one. It's the same thought pattern. You know, we, we don't, God doesn't absorb us and we just become a nobody. God loves us. And he gives us wisdom. He gives us knowledge. And when we accept his wisdom and knowledge, we become one with him because our purpose is the same as God's purpose. And as we walk with God, we're going to want to help people know what we're learning, what God is teaching us. Is that powerful or not? Well, the reason I share this with you is because God is a patient God. He is so patient with us. And yet, there comes a time when God says, that's it. There's nothing else left to do. I have given you this. I have tried to, and show, show, to show you this. But you are not listening. And so God says, okay, that's it. It's over. God does that to individuals. He can do that to you and me if we're not listening, right? And it's not that he doesn't love us. But if we're not listening, how many of you have ever had friends that wouldn't listen to you? And, you? and you know they needed to hear what you were saying. And you weren't trying to just drive something home to them. You were just trying to help them know something. And after a while, you just say, well, there's no need to say anything because they're not listening. And we probably all had some children that were that way. Okay? And, and so, and, and, you know, I, I'm just thinking... That's a soap opera. That's, um, and so, you know, God says, I'm going to do everything I can for you. But there comes a time if you're not listening. It's not that God walks away from you. The truth is that what's happening is you're walking away from God. And you're rejecting what he's saying. It's kind of like having alarm clock. Have you ever had your alarm clock and you're just sleeping away and you hear that and you just hit it because you don't want to hear it anymore and you go back to sleep. It comes on again and you hit it. And you do that several mornings and then one morning you wake up and you look at the and say, man, I overslept and you never heard the alarm clock. Ever had that happen to you? Because you shut it out long enough your brain says, we don't want to hear that. And you don't hear it. Isn't it similar to that? When we walk with God and we shut him out, we don't want to hear what he's got to say. And after a while, we don't hear it. And God says, there's only so much that I can do if you're not willing. Because God is never a God of force. That is the enemy's tactic is to force you into something anything that somebody's doing to try to force you to do something against your will is not from God you see it, it's it's an enemy tactic because God will tell you in a loving and a kind way you have the choice you accept or reject that's your choice and so God you know he's done everything and at some point your lesson says the curtains pulled, it's, a, it's over, it's done. It's done. And God worked with the people of ancient Babylon 
over and over and over. He gave them revelation after revelation after revelation of himself. And thank God, at least we know one person responded. Who was it? Nebuchadnezzar. He responded. And so we have one king in all of this that was saved. But when we get to Daniel, the fifth chapter, Nebuchadnezzar is dead. He's gone. And Nebuchadnezzar's grandson, which would be Belteshazzar, is now in charge of the kingdom because his daddy doesn't want the kingdom. His daddy, according to history, is off in the Thule somewhere in some palace just, you know, sipping a little this or that, and he's having a good time. And his son is taking care of this. But this son, he rejects God, doesn't he? He rejects God. They were co-rulers, but we don't know what happened to his father. He might have been caught up in that overthrow as well. But the events surrounding the last night of Babylon, we have recorded in this chapter, chapter 5, that we're going to talk about tonight. And I want you to notice that in the New Testament, these same events come up again. But instead of ancient Babylon, it's who? Modern Babylon. But the same things are happening. The same things are happening. So we have in the lesson it says, Revelation warns that what happened 2,500 years ago in ancient Babylon will be repeated in the last days. These historical stories are prophetic. These historical stories are prophetic because it is telling you what's going to happen before Jesus comes. These things are going to happen. So, tonight we're talking about the fall of Babylon and we're going to go to that last night of Babylon and we're going to see what the Bible has to say so let's go there and let's go to question number one it says list five things that Belteshazzar did to def that defiled God the God of heaven five things that he did well the first thing the Bible says he did was that Belshazzar made a great feast and it was in defiance of the God of heaven how do we know that well let's just keep going it says that he commanded, or I'm sorry, skip one. He drank wine before the thousands. So, he's having a big feast in defiance of God. He's drinking wine. What does wine do to our... It kind of numbs us and we don't know what we're doing, right? And then, what else is he doing? He commanded that they bring in the vessels from the temple of God, and they were going to then do what? You remember? They were going to drink out of them. Okay. And so it says the next thing he did was he drank from them. He drank from holy vessels, wine that was to represent his gods. In fact, it says in the next one, they praise the gods of gold and silver and bronze and iron and wood and stone. And it, it's just, when you think about this, this is an act of worship. They are worshiping false gods with the vessels of the true God. And God says, that's enough. It's enough. Belteshazzar must have had some knowledge of what had gone on before. He had to have heard stories about uh, Nebuchadnezzar and him going insane. He had to hear stories about the golden image on the plains of Dura. He had to hear about that dream that nobody could tell him what he dreamt but Daniel. He had to have heard all these things. There's no way that that kind of stuff happened in his day and he didn't know about it. There's no way. And I'm sure he must have heard about the fiery furnace. I mean, that would have been a story to remember, right? The fiery furnace. The problem is he didn't acknowledge God. 
after hearing all these stories, for you, you would say, wow, that, that really strengthens my faith in God. But not for him. It didn't do that, did it? All the leaders of Babylon were there. They were participating in the second orgy, this party that he was having. And while uh, it says there, and while in this drunken state, Belshazzar called for the vessels that had been taken from the temple of God from Jerusalem. And in defiance of the God of heaven, the rulers of Babylon drank intoxicating liquor from them. And they offered praise to false gods with emblems of the true God. Now, I don't know about you, but just think about this. This is kind of blending true worship with false worship. Do you hear me? I don't want you to forget about this. This is the blending of true worship and false worship. Does it work? You still got to lie, don't you? In other words, the devil does this. You know, he, he, he'll, give you, he'll give you about maybe sometimes 99.9% .9 truth, but he'll give you 1.1% 1, 1 error. It doesn't matter. A lie is a lie, isn't it? Don't you remember when you were a kid saying, well, it was just a little white lie? Right? Did your mama ever buy that? Did your daddy ever buy that little white lie story? Not mine. In those days, we knew what switches were. Okay? And so, you know, here, here's the truth. The truth is, is that they are... They are trying to merge true worship and false worship and push it off and force everybody else to do the same thing. And so God's vessels for pagan worship. Think about that. It was a straw that broke the camel's back, you might say. And God said, that's it. That's enough. So... Question number two says, in the midst of their blasphemy against God, what suddenly appeared and, and startled the entire assembly? What was it? And you just think about this, folks. You just think about this. You're in a room somewhere, and you're having a good time, and this bloodless hand starts writing across the wall. How fast would you get out? Okay, But the truth is, whose hand was it? It was God writing on the wall. Haven't you ever heard that phrase before? You see the writing on the wall yet. Well, that's where it came from. That's where it came from. And so fear must have just en en enveloped these people. They're just like, whoa, what's that? And, you know, uh, I don't know, um, I I've heard people tell stories where they've been drinking and they something happened and it just sobered them right up. And I'm imagining that these guys, all of a sudden, as drunk as they might be, and no, 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 tell them how long they've been in this condition, but when that handwriting went across the wall, it was like, sober me up, man. What is this? What is this? And so Belshazzar had every reason for his knees to be knocking. Every reason. This was a day of reckoning to him. It was over. He didn't know it exactly then, but it was over. And so the next question says, what did the king or who did the king call? Who did he call in? Oh, the wise men. The not-so-wise men, right? The not-so-wise men. So he hadn't learned anything, had he? No matter what he knew, he had not learned it. He called in the same people, the same group. Probably some of them were, were old enough to remember and had been there and seen some of the stuff take place. And they get to be called in again. I don't know. I might be scared to go in if I were one of those wise men. And the question is, were they able to interpret the writing? Nope. They are not able to interpret the writing. God is discrediting the, quote, 
not so wise men. He is discrediting them. And in your lesson, you know, you remember Daniel 2, they couldn't reveal the dream. But Daniel could. And uh, in Daniel 3, I mean in Daniel 4, they had the dream. They still couldn't tell the king. But Daniel could. And now there's writing on the wall. They see it, but they can't read it. But Daniel could. I want Daniel in my court. Hmm? I want Daniel in my court. That's right. And so he's discrediting them. And I want you to listen. I got this little uh, quote here that someone gave me. I want you to read it. This is Hollywood. What does Hollywood think about this kind of stuff? About, you know, because if you read these verses here, well, in fact, let's read these verses. 1 Corinthians 2.14. What is Paul saying here? You ready? It says, But the natural man does not receive the things of the Spirit of God. A natural man. What's a natural man? A man who's not following God. He doesn't understand the things of God. For they are foolishness to him, nor can he know them, because they are spiritually discerned. So spiritually things, we, you've heard this said before, spiritually things are, spiritual things are spiritually understood. So a man who doesn't know anything about spiritual things, to him it's like foolishness. Why do I want to listen to that? That doesn't make sense at all to him, right? And then in 1 Timothy 6, let me get over there. First Timothy 6, and it says in verse 20, Oh, Timothy, so Paul is talking to Timothy, he's finishing up his letter, he says, guard what was committed to your trust, avoiding the profane and the idle babblings and contradictions of what is falsely called what? There are a lot of things that people are talking about that seem to be knowledge, but you know what? Spiritually, they don't mean a thing. He says, Timothy, avoid those things. Hold on to what you got. What I'm telling you tonight is hold on to the truths that you're hearing. Hold on. Do not let them go. Because there are people out there who are going to say to you, that doesn't mean anything. What's that all about? Hold on. Do not let anyone take the word of God away from you. Don't let anyone take away these truths from you. Because... It could cost you a lot. And as I was thinking about these texts and this discrediting of the wise men, I wanted to show you this. How many of you have ever watched that program, L.A. Law? I saw it's gone now. It's old, but it's an old program. But you probably remember this guy's picture, right? Well, you probably never knew that he wasn't a believer in God because they don't, they, they're actors. Actors are hypocrites. That's what the Bible calls a hypocrite. It's an actor. It's one who lives a life that's not theirs, uh, not really real. You know, he's living somebody else's life. But he says in this, he says, the character he plays on L.A. Law, divorce lawyer Arnold Becker, has little on his mind other than winning cases and making lots and lots of money. But, is that Bernson? Bernson has plenty on his mind. To judge from an interview that he gave to the Washington Post, we, uh, we should legalize drugs, he says, and spend the money we now put into combating them into education. We should amend the Constitution to have a president for foreign affairs and a president for domestic affairs. And we should realize, he says, that religion has become an outdated answer to some of our problems. Hmm. And he, down later in the green there, he says, the sooner people realize we come from apes, and that's the 
it, it happened, the sooner we get a reality check on ourselves. <laughs> and at the very bottom, he says, if this means dismantling religion, we might have to do that. Is this somebody you want to listen to? <laughs> I mean, when you think about it, this guy is saying, it, it, this guy is the opposite of everything Paul just told us in the few two verses that we read. This is, is contradicting, contradicting everything that the Bible tells us about wisdom. Why do I want to listen to an actor or the Bible would call it a hypocrite because they're just living a life that's a life that's not theirs. Why do I want to listen to that over the Bible? You get it? Who do you want to worship? Who do you want to obey? We're going to look at what Daniel has to say about the uh, the, the this writing on the wall, and uh, so we're going to go to the next question. And that next question says, "Who suggests the king?" Call in Daniel. The queen. Now, you maybe you have never thought of this, but why do you think the queen wasn't there? Well, your lesson gives you some ideas. Probably she was one of those who had been converted. Surely the king, King Nebuchadnezzar, wasn't the only one who was converted by Daniel and, 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 his, and his friends. So probably she wasn't there because she didn't want to be a part of this drunken party. And so, for whatever reason, though, she hears the noise, comes in, and she says, hey, you need to go get Daniel. Daniel will know. Did she know about Daniel? I think so. Otherwise, how would she have recommended him? But she knew about Daniel, and so she, she sends for Daniel, or she has them send for Daniel, and Daniel actually takes care of of this issue and it says what position did Belshazzar offer Daniel if he read the interpretation of the interpreted and read and interpreted the writing what did he offer him third ruler do you know that many people just tried to discredit the book of Daniel because of this statement third ruler third ruler there was no three rulers well yes there was there were already two, Nebuchadnezzar and Belshazzar. He would be the third. Because his daddy was really in charge, but he just kind of did what he wanted to do with what dad had given him. And he says, I'll make you the third ruler. Did that entice Daniel at all? No, nope. he didn't care. Daniel didn't care. He knew. And question seven says, before interpreting the writing, Daniel fearlessly reminds Belshazzar of Nebuchadnezzar's insanity because he failed to recognize and honor the God of heaven. He reminds him, you're in this position because you did not recognize God as the ruler of heaven and earth. So, did Belshazzar already know this? I think he did. In fact, the Bible says, you knew all of this. In fact, I want to go to that verse in Daniel chapter 5. I want us to read that because it really gives force here when we read it. And um, Daniel chapter 5, let's see what verse is it. Um, let me find where I am on these notes here. Yes, let's start with verse 17. And it says this. Oh, turn the page. And it says this. Um, then Daniel answered, and he said before the king, Let your gifts be for yourself, and give your rewards to another. Yet I will read the writing to the king and make known to him the interpretation. Now, you know, to be this forceful with the king, he could have had his head taken right off, right? But he knew 
if he had Daniel's head taken off, he wouldn't know what this mean, means. So he's going to at least get the answer. And it says, Yet I will read the writing to the king and make known to him the interpretation. O king, the most high God gave Nebuchadnezzar your father a, a kingdom and a majesty, glory and honor. And because of the majesty that he gave, God gave him, all peoples, nations, and languages trembled and they feared before him. Whomever he wished, he executed. Whomever he wished, he kept alive. Whomever he wished, he set up. And whomever he wished, he put down. But when his heart was lifted up and his spirit was hardened in pride, he was deposed from his kingly throne. And they took his glory from him. Then he was driven in, uh, from the sons of men. His heart was made like, a, a, like the beast, and his dwelling was with the wild donkeys. They fed him with grass like oxen, and his, and his body was wet with the dew of heaven, till he knew that the Most High God rules in the kingdom of men and appoints over it whomever he chooses. Now, he's not holding back, is he? He hasn't stopped yet. Listen, he says, But you, his son, Belshazzar, have not humbled your heart. Although you knew all of this, you knew it and you didn't humble your heart. And you have lifted yourself up against the Lord of heaven. Wow. Daniel... This is, this is what God, men and women of God can do when they're led by God. Even in the New Testament, it says you, you will have the opportunities to stand up before kings and judges and, and say things. God's going to give you that opportunity. Probably not necessarily everybody, because we don't have that many judges. But we have enough that's, that need to hear things. And God's going to give you that opportunity. Walk with God like Daniel, and you'll be able to say, because God will put it in your mouth. He will not leave you there to say, um, well, um, yeah, uh, I, I don't know what to say. I mean, what can I say? No, God will put it in your mouth. And when you walk obey, it will be one of those aha moments like, how'd that happen? And you'll know that God has spoken through you although although you knew all of this daniel says what had belshazzar done that had invoked the wrath of god what had he done in question number eight what had he done he had lifted up he says you have lifted yourself up and you have brought the vessels of god and you have drunken, drank wine or drunk wine from them. Wow. Now, this is what I want you to know. This is a defiling act. This is actually mixing truth with error. Pagan worship with true worship. Paganism and God's word. They were mixing it. They were taking the vessels that were consecrated to the worship of God and they were mixing it with the worship of false pagan deities. In fact, um, he uses God's vessels that had been dedicated for that reason to worship God. Can you imagine? Would that not say anything to you? It's a counterfeit, isn't it? Isn't that what a counterfeit is? When you try to take something that's real and mix a little something with it and still make it look like the real thing hmm? right 
Now, you can't have a counterfeit $3 bill. Why? There's not a real one. But that's my point. You can have counterfeit 20s. You can have counterfeit, you know, people mostly counterfeit $20 because it's easy to get them passed along and get your money, walk off. But this is what the king was trying to do. He was trying to counterfeit true worship the way he wanted it, the way he wanted it. Well, number nine says, give the meaning of the words written on the wall. What does it say? Many, God had numbered and finished it. Your kingdom's over. That's what he's saying. He says, Tekel, he says, thou art weighed in the balances and found what? Wanting. So your, your number's up, buddy. And you're wanting. In other words, you are lacking. And it says, Perez, the kingdom is divided and is given to the Medes and the Persians. Now, they lost that battle. Your lesson tells you, 538 B.C., they lost that battle. And they lost that battle because, you see, they were so pious, they were so proud that they would actually, when they were encountering enemies, they, I told you before, they would stand up and they would just throw food at them. They had enough food to last a whole lot longer than they were going to be down there. But what they didn't know is that God had a way of taking care of that. And um, so what had happened was that they actually were drunk and they left the leaf gates open. You know, when you've got a river coming through, you've got to have a gate under the water so people can't just swim under, right? Well, they left the leaf gates open because they were snockered and they swam. Well, they didn't swim under because what they did was they went downstream and they dug another trench and it was more than a trench, but... You know, they had a big army, and they, they just diverted the river. The water went down, and they walked through. They marched right through on the riverbed. They went in. They took the king. They took the whole kingdom. Because God had prophesied before it would ever happen, long before this happened, that Cyrus would be the man who would go in and do it. God knows the end from the beginning, doesn't he? And it says in number 10, uh, the first part, it says, How soon was the prophecy fulfilled? It says, That very night. That very night. And it says, And who became the new ruler of Babylon? Now you can pronounce it Darius, or you can pronounce it Darius. And there's one other pronunciation, but I won't muddy the water with it. But... Um, um, I've always pronounced it Darius. I have a, a cousin whose name is Darius. And uh, when I learned about this, I say, hey, you're, you have a Bible name. He said, yeah, but I don't pronounce it the same. So a lot of people don't even use the word Darius, but it's pronounced Darius. But it is correct for your understanding either way. But I use the word Darius. That's all I've ever used. And um, so, anyway, Darius is there. And actually, when you think about this, folks, this is a symbolic fall of spiritual Babylon in the last days. And so, what's happening, what happened in Babylon that night is just a symbol of what's going to happen in the last days. And we're going to look at it here in a few minutes. But the question, uh, next question says, how does the book of Revelation describe the fall of modern spiritual Babylon at the, t at the end time? What does it say? It says that the river Euphrates is going to be what? Dried up. Was this the river Euphrates that was going through Babylon? What happened to it? It dried up. Not naturally, but it did dry up, didn't it? So, okay. And so it dried up, it says. And, and, and what did it do? It made ways for the kings of the east. That's what it's going to happen in the last days. But in this particular case, it made way for the king, right, to come in. Cyrus, come in, take it over. All right? Um, so, 
The same condition is going to happen in the last days of earth's history. It's a parallel event. Revelation and uh, talking about spiritual Babylon and Daniel 5 talking about uh, ancient Babylon. And so that river is going to be dried up again and all the support for spiritual Babylon is going to collapse. It's going to dry up. And the kings of the east are going to come in and they're going to take over. We'll talk about that in Lesson 25. But number 12 says, what happened or what happens when the kings of the east come to deliver God's people? What happens? Oh, I, I forgot that text. Let's go back Let's go and read that text. Revelation 16. Revelation 16, we're going to go to verse 12. And somehow, yeah, I guess it all is the same color. Revelation 16, beginning with verse 12, and it says, Then the sixth angel poured out his bowl on the great river Euphrates, and its water was dried up, so that the way of the kings from the east might be prepared. And I saw three unclean spirits like frogs coming up out of the mouth of the dragon, out of the mouth of the beast, and out of the mouth of the false prophet. For they are spirits of demons performing signs which go out to the kings of the earth and of the whole world to gather them to the battle of the great day of God Almighty. Behold, I am coming as a thief. Blessed is he who watches and keeps his garments, lest he walk naked, and they see his shame. And he gathered them together to that great, to that to the place called in the Hebrew Armageddon. And verse 17 says, Then the seventh angel poured out his bowl into the air, and a loud voice came out of the temple of heaven from the throne, saying, It is done. Have you ever heard of that before? It is finished. And there were noises and thunderings and lightnings, and there was a great earthquake, such a mighty and a great earthquake as has not occurred since men were on the earth. Now the great city was divided into three parts, and the cities of the nations fell. And great Babylon was remembered before God to give her the cup of the wine of the fierceness of his wrath. Babylon's going to fall again. And we'll talk about that more. Let's go to Isaiah 45. Isaiah 45, verses 1 to 4, it says, Thus says the Lord to his anointed, who is his anointed? Cyrus whose right hand I have held to subdue nations before him and loose the armor of kings to open before him the double doors, the leaf gates, so that the gates will not be shut. I will go before you and make the crooked places straight. I will break in pieces the gates of bronze and cut the bars of iron. I will give you the treasures of darkness and hidden riches of secret places that you may know that I am the Lord who called you by your name. Wow, think about that. And he goes on and he says, For Jacob my servant's sake, and Israel, my elect, I have even called you by your name. I have named you, though you have not known me. I am the Lord, and there is no other. There is no God beside me. I will gird you, though you have not known me. God called a pagan king to set his people free. To set them free. 
Number 12 says, what happened when the kings of the east, what happens when the kings of the east come to deliver God's people? What does the Bible say? We read it. Great Bob Babylon was what? It was, re it was remembered before God. Babylon is not a place you want to be. Not a place you want to be. Because here they are mixing truth and in error and using it as if it were true and we're going to learn more about that as we go by so let's go look at the characteristics of modern Babylon and let's see what it says this will just be kind of a little teaser for you when we till we get there but um, revelation is clear that there's another Babylon right it's at the time of the end and the Bible foretells the rise of another Babylon, which will do the same to God's people as did ancient Babylon. Modern Babylon is the final great oppressor of the people of God. Any wonder why God says, come out of her, my people. Number 13 says, let's talk, well, okay. The same event that, a, that caused the fall of ancient literal Babylon will cause the fall of modern spiritual Babylon at the time of the end. That same event is that they are actually um, mixing truth and error. Teaching it as truth. Teaching it as if they are serving God. Okay. So, what does the Bible call Babylon? Depends on which translation you read it from the King James. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's not a nice word. Okay? But in the New King James, it calls her a harlot. Okay? A harlot. Okay? One who sits on many waters, it says. So, here you have this power that mixes truth and error and it it's it's but yet it's involved in spiritual adultery okay spiritual adultery because it's involved in an illicit affair because if they are mixing themselves with truth and error it's just like for you if you say you love god and yet you dabble with stuff that god has told you not to it's called spiritual adultery. You're saying, I love God, but at the same time, I like this God too. I, I, I want to I have a little affair with this. And the point is, is that she's called a what? A harlot. Question 14 says, what do the waters that the harlot sits on, what does it represent? You know the answer to this, right? People, nations, multitudes, tongues. And so um, we're t talking about she sits upon the people. She's among the people. And so, and so she, she is mixing truth and error among the people. Have you ever known somebody that just kind of, just about everything that comes out of their mouth is mm, it's kind of mixed with, it's, it's not all, all true and it's just kind of like, Where's this going to lead to? And everything they say does this. But they talk to a lot of people. Does, what does that do for people? It gives them mixed signals, doesn't it? So here we have people over which this Babylon is controlling. And she's called a harlot. Because of her illicit relationship, she's not being honest with God. She's mixing truth. She's mixing error. And it says, um, what is the great sin of Babylon? What was it? Fornication. An illicit affair with someone who is not God. 
when we choose to say we love God and we walk with someone who is not God or doesn't love God and we're mixing ourselves, what do we do? We're having an illicit relationship. And so Babylon's great sin is fornication. Babylon's great sin is adultery. And adultery is an illicit relationship with someone who's not your spouse. And so this woman, a woman in Bible prophecy represents who? A church. And so if this woman is God's church, and yet it's dabbling in something that is not of God, it's having an immoral relationship, so to speak. You understand what I'm saying? An illicit relationship. And so it's called spiritual adultery. And so in Daniel 5, ancient Babylon acted defiantly, and they had an illicit relationship mixing the elements of worship, the worship of God, with the worships of paganism. And it says that spiritual Babylon is going to do the same thing. Going to do the same thing. Have an illicit relationship mixing elements of true worship with false worship. Hmm. This is in your lesson. Uh, at least part of it is. So Satan's technique is to mix a little error with a lot of truth. Secondly, mixing error appears spiritually, but really it's it's not, is it? So it's making error appear like it's something that it's, it's not, but people don't know any different. Why? Because they haven't studied the Word. Three, um, blessing you while you're living in sin. Think about it. You're doing what God has asked you not to do. You're, you're prospering. The devil doesn't care. He don't, doesn't mind you prosper as long as that keeps you where you are. Make sense? This is his technique. He'll make it look like truth. He'll make it look religious. He'll make it look spiritual at the same time blessing you, but it's the same in, in, in different, uh, the same ending. In, uh, it is the same in the end, okay? Yes. Number 16. What does God call this harlot who defile, defiles God by mixing paganism and Christianity? What does God call her? Babylon the Great. Babylon the Great. Now, I want you to notice that note there under number 15, 16. It says, in Revelation, God is warning us against an apostate system. You know what the word apostate means? It means false. It's not real. I mean, it's, 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 it's got error mixed into it. This apostate system of religion that mixes paganism with Christianity, and yet it claims to worship God. We must be vividly aware that both Daniel and Revelation are warning us against a false religious system in the last day that, that will attempt to force people to worship God falsely by mixing paganism and Christianity. Just as ancient Babylon defied God by mixing elements of the worship of God with the worship of pagan deities. You see, the, you see what's happening here. On number 17 it says, What message does God proclaim about modern spiritual Babylon? What does he say about her? Babylon is fallen, is fallen. It's the habitation of what? Demons. But yet it appears spiritual. Is this serious business? This is Babylon in its fallen state. And so just as ancient Babylon fell and, and when it defied God by mixing the true worship with false worship, with paganism, that's the way it's going to be in the last days. 
in the time of the end. Babylon will do the same. Modern spiritual Babylon will do the same thing. But the Bible says it's a place where the devil dwells. And to me, when it says where devils dwell, well, we know the, angel, the devil has a third of the angels, right? So it's where all the bad guys live. And question number 18 says, how widespread will be the influence of mighty modern spiritual Babylon in the last day? How widespread is this going to be? Worldwide. It'll be worldwide. All the nations have drunk of the wine, of the wrath. All nations. So, I want to read something to you. It says, God does not call people to reform Babylon. God does not call people to reform Babylon. He calls them to get out of Babylon. Because you don't have the power to reform someone who is controlled by the devil himself. Okay? So God is calling his people. He's saying, then that's the next um, statement there. It says, a, a question. It says, what loving message does God send out to his people who are in Babylon? What, is he, what do he say? And, and in essence, if we're, if we're in Babylon and we really love God, what do we need to do? He says, come out of her. Come out of her, my people. So, so this worldwide spiritual apostasy from truth is what we're seeing in the last days. And her adultery is worldwide Nearly all the people, not everybody, but nearly all the people are into this. And so God says, come out, come out. So God is stating that he has people in Babylon. And he's, he's, he wants to send a message to them. You need to come out of that. You need to get out of there. Because if you don't get out, you're going to die. You're going to die there. Wow. Wow. So God is calling his people out. Spiritual Babylon. Come out of her. Because sooner or later he's going to pour out the judgment. And we'll talk about that later. But in question number 20, it says, If you ever find yourself ensnared by this Babylonian system that unites paganism and Christianity, will you heed, will you listen to the warning of God's word to come out of Babylon? Is that your desire? Well, Jesus wants you to come out because Jesus is asking, come out of her. Come out of her, my people. Well, let's sum up what we've been talking about this evening. First of all, all that purports to be truth, in other words, it's supposed to be truth, may not be truth. We need to know the Word of God, right? Because there, is, there are systems out there that actually are telling us that, that telling us that this is real, but in reality they're mixing paganism with true worship. And it's still, you know, a truth and a lie together is still a what? A still a lie. And then it says... Uh, there was an apostasy in the days of historical Babylon, and spiritual Babylon represents a major apostasy today. That's what we've learned tonight. And then, in, religion, in religious and spiritual matters, the majority is always wrong. Did you hear that? You know, we always hear, well, the majority rules, you know. Well, um, there are a lot of things right now, even our own government within our own country now, that the majority is ruling on, but that doesn't mean it's right, does it? And when it comes to spiritual things, who is really going to be right? Are the, is the majority going to be right? No, if we don't know, if we don't know this, 
we're going to hang in with the majority. And it's not going to work so well. Well, let's go through the response questions. If it's clear to you from tonight's lesson that there is a major spiritual apostasy called Babylon in the last days, put a check in box one. And if it's your desire to follow the Bible only instead of the Babylonian thinking that mixes truth and error, put a check in box two. And here you go. If you answered yes to question 20, put a check in box three. If you answered yes to question 20, put a check in box 20. And maybe... I mean, in, in, in box three. And you, you may have to go back and look at that. That's okay. And see what you put down. Okay. So, the next lesson is this Saturday at 11. Conflict over true worship. Conflict over true worship. So, that's going to be our next lesson. And what time we need to be here? I didn't hear that. What time? 11 o'clock. 11 o'clock. Okay. Some of you are giving mixed messages, see? There was some truth and there was some error here. <laughs> and I want you to know the truth. It's 11. But now, if you want to be a part of the Sabbath school, uh, you come at 945. We're studying the book of Genesis. And I'm telling you, it is a wonderful book that we're studying about. And I just think that you will be glad that you are here. Let's bow our heads. Father in heaven, we thank you so much for the time that we have together. It's always fun to just look at your word and see where you're leading us, where you want us to go, what you want us to know. I pray that you'll help us to hang on to your word and remember you will never leave us. You will never forsake us. And before it happens, you will reveal it to us because we need to know. But help us to be close to you so we can hear those words coming from you. And I pray that as we go our separate ways this evening, you'll keep us safe until we meet again. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.